You are about to witness a global movement. The medical system has failed us. Pharmaceuticals are designed to make us sick, weak, dependent. Not anymore. This is the Medicine Girl Podcast with renowned healing expert and registered nurse, Robin Stevens. Every week, we shine the light on new ways to heal your body from the root, ignite your inner healer, and tap into your divine wisdom. Begin to live harmoniously with your mind, body, and spirit. You are stronger than you think, braver than you realize. Now is the time to wake up and start living healthier, wealthier, and laugh out loud happier. And here we go. Hello and welcome to the Medicine Girl podcast. It is me, Robin Stebbins, and I am here with Tanya Crombie, a certified life coach who has her master's and doctorate degree in industrial and organizational psychology. And you recently wrote a book, which is what I really would like to talk to you about. So if you wouldn't mind introducing our listeners to a little bit of your background and why you decided to write this book. I would love to. Thank you so much for having me uh, talk to you and to your audience today, Robin. Thank you. You're so welcome. Um, So my book, um, so you said I have a PhD in organizational psychology. I worked in corporate America. Um, I've done, I've been coaching for a very, very long time and I've done a lot of like executive coaching. And then I did some work with young people, but what really kind of caused me to write this book was like, I guess, a lot of people who write books. It was my own life. It was my own story. Um, I have two kids who are both awesome. And I'm always very careful when I tell any stories about my kids to, cause some, it can come across because only one of my children has anxiety. So I don't ever want Mm. anyone to read or listen or think, Oh, she has one good kid and one bad kid. I have two perfect kids that are awesome. They each have their own struggles. Um, but my child who struggles with anxiety, um, she really went through some rough times in her middle school years. And when she went through her rough times, obviously the whole family went through some hard times. It was a, a it was a struggle because the way I like to tell people is I guess a family's like a car. And if, you know, if the brake pads are going out, that's just one part of the car, but the whole car is going off the road. And that was sort of what happened to our family when my daughter was really struggling. Um, And so I wrote a book about what I learned and what I went through. And it's not a, oh, here's Dr. Tanya Crombie telling you what to do. It's here's a mom who's been there. And if you're there, I feel you, I hear you. And I've been there too. That's really, it's, it's a labor of love, not a, you know, academic work. <laughs> that, and that's really good. And I, I really resonate with the anxiety. I have a 13 year old son now, but, um, and he's just going into middle school and getting his anxiety has gotten a lot better, but it was very prominent um, almost up until fourth or fifth grade. And it was, it was a real learning curve for me. Every day was different. And to be able to share that, I, was, I felt kind of alone. I felt judged. I felt like a lot of parents were blaming me for parenting this way. So I really want to talk to you about that and, and get into um, kind of what I've noticed right now with the kids. And we had talked about this earlier the kids being home and dealing with this pandemic are actually their anxiety has come down a lot. So, you know, and that's really an interesting point to make. I think a lot of things have have improved. We've seen the planet and the environment improve in just a few weeks Mm -hmm. with, with just a slowing down of the, the human impact. So with, in regards to parenting a child with anxiety, what, can, what can you kind of give us as sort of the background and, and how to work with it? Well, like you said, um, right now, in a weird way, this social distancing and quarantining at home and all of that has given us kind of a weird opportunity with our kids. I would say all of them because, 
you know, I write, stop, my book is stop worrying about your anxious child as if that's something unique when really anxiety and fear and panic are normal human emotions that everybody feels, every kid feels. We all feel, you know, to a different degree. Some of the kids, you know, I call my daughter high highs and low lows because that's how she's been since she was born. Mm -hmm. And my son is, I call him no drama because he just, his range is about this big and my daughter's range is, you know, like this. Yeah. And that's, that's just their normal temperaments. It's not one's good and one's bad. It's just who they are. And that's how, I think that, that's how they come into the world too. And it's, totally. especially, yeah, and especially easy to judge when you, when you don't have children. And I think yes. in the 20s, it was easy for me to say, well, you know, you're just parenting, parenting them to be anxious or you're feeding into it. But absolutely not the case. I know personally, and, and the judgment or the stares from other parents um, only makes it worse. Yeah, absolutely. It totally makes it worse. So um, I'm going to come back to the judgment piece, but let me um, just say one thing to parents who are home right now with their kids. Um, so what I'm hearing from my clients right now is the my clients, it's very funny because my clients always will, you know, and things are going wrong with their kids. I hear from them a lot. And suddenly I'm hearing them from a lot about what's going on with them. The, the oh, kids right. are doing great. And now they're yeah. like, oh, I've got a homeschool. I've got this, I've got that. And the parents are the ones who are feeling all the big feelings right now. The stuff that made our kids anxious to a large extent, some, some are still struggling, but to a large extent, kids with social anxiety, doing great. Kids who had performance anxiety with sports are doing great. Kids who didn't like school and had separation anxiety, didn't want to leave their parents, they're doing great. You know, all of those things went away. Yeah. Kids are doing great. Parents are feeling anxiety. And so what I've been really trying to encourage my, my clients right now is this is that chance that you may never get again to your kid is in a, a good, calm space where they're willing to listen to you. And you have an opportunity to say something to them that we don't get to say very often, which is, I know how you feel. I get it. Mm -hmm. it it's normal. And I feel that way too. Right now, I'm feeling all those feelings that you struggle with. And so be like, be real authentic, be real open with your kids. It's going to, it makes them feel such a relief to know they're not alone, that their mom and dad feels it too. And then you also can say things to them like, you know what really helps me? I'm feeling super overwhelmed because this math that I'm trying to teach you, I haven't tried to do in 20 years and I don't even know how to do what you're doing. So I need to calm down. I need to take a few deep breaths or I need to sit down and just focus on my breath and meditate or I want to do a couple yoga poses or I want to have a five minute dance party. Just Anything that breaks up the anxiety, yeah. it's great for you as a parent. It's great for your kid. And there's a super secret thing that you're doing that your kid doesn't realize is you are teaching them what to do when they feel that way. So the yes. next time they feel overwhelmed, they're like, oh yeah, I remember my mom said, sit here and breathe on a cushion. I'm going to try yeah. that for a few minutes, you know? So or, it's like or I see what I see. Um, we're in California, so the weather's amazing. But I've seen just record numbers of families outside. I, I mean, I hike every day. And normally, um, I'll see one person. I'm seeing 10, 15, maybe sometimes 20 groups of these little family systems looking happy and engaging with each other. And, and they have to. You can't run off and go join some others groups, you know, we've all got to keep our social distance. But I, I see this really kind of warms my heart that yeah. these, maybe you're connecting so deeply for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. Or reconnecting. I would say for my family, because I have a 17 year old and a 16 year old um, yeah. who always have something better to do than to be with their mom and dad, you know, and they <laughs> like last night we did a puzzle. The whole family did a puzzle together and it had a ball, but that's yeah. not something we ever, they always have too much homework. They have, you know, there's activities after school. So many activities. Yeah. Pointing to point B, trying to keep up with everybody else's activities. Yeah. It can be. And I think that 
that stress, hopefully we'll, it'll take everyone just a moment to take a breath and re-examine what's important. And maybe we don't need to be in 10 activities a week. Maybe one or two would suffice. Exactly. Exactly. Because our kids are, um, when you compare their pace of life to what ours was, or even the generation, you know, the kids that are just coming out of college, even, it's like it keeps ramping up and ramping up. And, and that does uh, impact that overall constant feeling of kind of the low level of anxiety that a lot of them just always have. Yes. And, and just sort of the what's next. And there's no, I don't see anything of just a time where you just sit and do nothing or hang out or chat or just sit on the porch in the sun. We're always doing something. And when we're not doing something, we're glued to our screens. Right. And this, you know, this can be a great way to, to awaken to the possibilities of, of deeper connection and reducing anxiety and reducing that need to just do, do, do be human beings, not doings for a while. Yes. My kids have been walking my dogs. One kid went on a run with me, which I couldn't have paid him a million dollars to do a few months ago, you know, things like that. But there have been some real silver linings to all of this. And yeah, I think that reduction in anxiety and giving us all this deep breath to kind of reset is is a gift, a real yes. gift, especially for the anxious ones. Especially for the anxious ones. So getting back to these anxious children, mm-hmm. um, what's your take? It's you know, it sounds like you've you've had a a nice study in your life from point A to now. Is she sixteen or seventeen? Yeah. But to be able to kind of look back and 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 through writing your book, what, what's your takeaways from what childhood anxiety is and how can we help with it? So, like I said, my, my firm belief is it's a normal part of being human. And it's, you know, we all feel big emotions. Sadness is a normal part of being human. Um, we have kind of as a culture gotten there's just been some messages over the past, you know, 20 years that have said, you know, if you don't feel well, take a pill. Um, And I'm not here advocating, you know, if you've, if your child needs medication, that is a, a personal choice. But what I do feel strongly about is that every single bad emotion doesn't need to be medicated. Um, And sometimes we want that quick fix because it is, it, it doesn't feel great to be anxious or to be depressed or to be, you know, sad, but sometimes those are a normal cycle. Like, you know, when my mother died, um, I probably was clinically depressed, but I had a legitimate reason. I was grieving and it took me a while to work through that grief. Um, yes. And I don't know that a medication would have been the right thing yeah, I mean, and that is what this podcast is about. And and again, like you said, anyone that has used medications in a time of crisis or acute phases, that's usually what medications are for. You right. know, you're 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 tight, you're so tightly bound in anxiety or depression, you simply can't meditate exactly. or get your way out of it. So medications can be useful for for a very short term. The I think really what's happening with big pharma and the way this system is going is that we don't have a diagnosis until we've already got a medication. So all of a sudden now we've got all of these different diagnoses and everyone's diagnosing themselves and diagnosing other people. And, and then you go in and you, you want something quick because that's what we're so used to. Here's my symptom. Here's my medication. Done. We don't have to deal with it anymore. I don't have to talk. I'm working three jobs. My kids are now, you know, driving me bananas. Mm-hmm. Just give me a quick fix. Right. You know, and I think that's, if we change though the mindset and, and the quick fix really becomes more of a, a burden and more of a problem because we get symptoms from the medications and sometimes we're going to get more medications for those medications, and it just starts this spiral. And we still haven't alleviated the original root of the problem. I think 
The difference is, you know, if I give you a blood pressure medication, I can see on my manual blood pressure cuff, your blood pressure has gone down with this amount of milligrams. When you give somebody a pill for, I'm feeling sad, or I'm feeling anxious, it's so subjective. I can't, or you can't really tell, is this working? Is this a placebo? Am I just, is it just, run, am I running the course of this instead of making those disease, those emotions a disease, sadness, right. anxiety? They're, they're just, like you said, part of the human experience. And the more we learn to navigate through those and make friends with those emotions, yes. I think the better off we are. Yes. And that's exactly, you know, going back to my, my own child, as I said, she came into this world, the high, high, low lows kid and the high highs of her joy. She was just a joyful, joyful baby. And those outweighed all the low lows, always every, every single moment of low lows I would take because the high highs are great. Um, but you know, as a baby, she was that baby who went from calm and happy to starving to death, screaming crazy, like what just happened to this child? And we had to, my husband yeah. and I were like, what, what is doing going yeah. on? So um, that's her nature. And what I feel like her job is all through childhood and adolescence and these teenage years is to figure that out, to learn about herself, to learn. Sometimes I'm going to have these big feelings and I've got to know how to manage them and I've got to learn some skills. And that's the risk of jumping too quickly when they can't get through a day of school or can't get through life. Yes, medication is helpful, but at the same time, it's so important that they learn skills to navigate just these things that are who they are going to be for the rest of their lives, you know? Yeah. And, and trying not to, to shortcut it or look for the magic fix yeah. because the medications really aren't a fix. And I think if, you know, you delve a little bit into the research and any, any psychotropic medications and anything for emotions have proven to be really ineffective. And when you weigh the side effects, the side effects are very damaging. And then again, what you're saying, you know, when you have these children, I like the high highs. <laughs> you can't have the high highs unless you're going to have the low lows where we're dynamic beings. So you can't be on one end of the spectrum only. Right. That's just not sustainable and that's not a human condition. So to navigate, like when you come in to the world with that, and my son did too, it's just, you know, he's wired for sound and every noise was difficult for him to navigate. It's just so sensitive to his environment. Yes. And, and to be able to help him as when he was younger, here's how you can navigate it from my standpoint. But as he gets older, he's going to have to learn what works for him. He's going to have to learn his own path with the way he's wired. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And they all are. Um, and I think the earlier we as parents identify this, I just had a really great conversation with a mom of a three and a half year old, and she's already seeing some, some signs that this three and a half year old has some big fears about separation and what's going to happen. And, and we started talking about, so with this three and a half year old, you're in a perfect situation to almost to say like this feeling you have. I, I was telling her, give it a name. Let's call it Fred. Fred mm. is going to be with you for the rest of your life. Fred's going to come and go, and you've just got to be friends with Fred. And we're going to learn how to get managed to, so that Fred can get feel okay and you can feel okay. And, but Fred's always going to be there. Yeah. Um, so make friends with Fred now. <laughs> that, I, and that, I think for anything any disease state. I worked in mental health for 10 years. Now I'm a registered nurse working with patients. I think for any disease state, when you stop fighting it, and I know that's so hard to, for people to, to get that because it's, we're so trained to fight disease and fight our emotions. And, and instead, when you change that energy to teammates or like Fred, let's just be friends. At least we can be friends. I, I'm aware of you now. I have yeah. the awareness. So you're not controlling me. You're not puppets, puppet stringing me through my life. But now we can be teammates. And it's like, oh, Fred's here. He's 
big today or, you know, whatever it is, right. but you own it and then it doesn't become something you're suppressing and making bigger or making worse. Exactly. Exactly. And you, um, yeah, when you almost start seeing how Fred is, um, and I, I tell like teenagers, I talk to about this a lot about that. This is like a biological gift. This is what kept our species alive. The, the super chill surfer dude going through the jungle got eaten by a lion. Yeah. Like they're yeah. gone. They first did not have children. First, first <laughs> gone. So your, your genes came through generation after generation of people who were like, what is that? I got it. I better run, better hide, better fight. Something you just know. rustled in the bush three miles away. I'm on it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I'm exactly. more of that personality. Or, there's a ship approaching. Those people don't yes. look friendly. I am out of here. You know, yes. all of those Danger. stories. Yes. That's what we have. And so it's a gift. It's your friend. And when Fred shows up, you have to be like, oh, Fred, I know you're trying to help me. Because that's truly what this is. Yes. It is but we're reacting to things that won't, that aren't the lion, that aren't the Vikings, like they are. Our bodies still have all of that biology from being in a jungle and being afraid of being eaten and now we just have to be like oh fred it's okay I'm yeah I'm eaten today yes. but i i know you're trying to help and thank you because too i think you know we do have to navigate a lot of dangerous people you know yes. they're not out to eat us or kill us but they are out to harm us in different ways and so you get a, a feeling for somebody that's not safe to be around and kids i think are very attuned to that and i think as parents the one thing I'm very careful is to not make him hug anyone he doesn't feel comfortable hugging, not being friendly, polite, please and thank you. But if you're not comfortable with that person, whether it's a family member or friends that are coming over, I trust it and you get to have sovereignty over your body. Absolutely. In fact, I would argue, and I've talked a lot to my own child about this, that what her superpower is her ability to feel, I call it her sketch meter. She has had the strongest sketch meter since she was a little bitty girl. She would be like, I don't like this neighborhood. I'm not yeah. sure about this place. And, you know, she's, she just senses it strongly. Yeah. She has that good sixth sense, good intuition. And when you have that, when you can pick up energy of other people really well, it can cause you that's, to have anxiety that other people yes. are like, what's going on? I don't get it. Yeah. And, and that's such a superpower though, yes. too, because especially navigating with business partners or employees, mm -hmm. um, fellow employees, who can I trust? Who, who do I just have, what you said, that sketch feeling or my son would, even when he was in preschool, he's like, don't like him, mama. Don't like him. You know, it was just <laughs> black and white. And yeah. I would always, you know, I would kind of look observe it from afar I wouldn't make him wrong but I would just sort of observe that person over a few months and he was right pretty much 100% of the time so yeah. it's when you don't make him wrong and you don't make it seem like something's wrong with you you have this disorder now it needs to be treated right. instead hey, this is a superpower maybe turned up a little too high for our environment right now and now we can discern which is the danger but always listen to our guts Yes. Yes. I mean, my, this is my teenage daughter. So I do think what a gift, what a gift to sense danger around her. I've told her, I was like, I don't think you'll ever be mugged because yeah. I just think you have a, such a good, like, yes, yeah, it's not safe. I'm not going down that alley. Yeah. So, and you can feel the energy and the heart can predict things 20 to 30 seconds into the future. So when, it, when that, do it more than the average person, which is yes. yeah, superpower. But well, I, yeah, I love that you find the friend out of this and the gifts out of it. Cause that really, I think a, when we get, maybe go back to what it feels like to be judged as a parent with, with raising children like this, but to be able to own it within yourself and within your own family and saying, this is just, this is an incredible gift. Let's, let's work on it together. Let's navigate how to wield it effectively in your life, as opposed to 
being judged and thinking that you need to change your parenting style or that you're enabling or making it worse. So let's, right. let's talk a little bit about the, the judgmental and, and it, uh, let, I'll just ask the question, the devil's advocate question. Are we making it worse by helping them navigate this as a gift? Um, I don't think so. I really don't. I think that anytime we can help our kids accept and like themselves, that that is the way to go because the world is hard. <laughs> the world is going to shoot them down. The world can yes. make them feel bad about themselves. So the more messages can get from us that actually I'm okay. This is okay. This is normal. Um, I, I don't think we're making it by any stretch. I actually, I, the analogy I like to use is, so you, every single one of us is walking through this world like a baby who is learning how to walk. We are figuring it out all of the time. Yes. Our kids are, and so are we. And if at any time this baby who's trying to walk takes a couple steps and falls down, and we start yelling at it, you're a stupid baby. You are wrong, baby. You can't walk, baby, and do these. Is the baby going to walk better? That's yeah. the analogy of, you know, making, aiming our kids or telling them they're wrong or telling them there's something. I just don't think it helps. Um, right. It doesn't help yeah. us either. <laughs> it, it, that's what I was just going to say. It, it absolutely doesn't help when we do that to ourselves thinking, you know, that mentality of pull yourself up by the bootstraps, work harder, work faster. I'm going to be very cruel to myself to motivate. That's not motivating. And when I, I had no. the, the energy before, so I had that up until I was maybe 40. Um, and now in my 50s, I'm getting a lot more calm and linked up to self-love and forgiveness. And that energy is so much more powerful. And I am so much more productive. Yes, that I'm in exactly the same place. And I would say in my phase is the shift that when I made it to, and yes, I went through all of my thirties and forties, believing that if I just beat myself up enough, I could be faster, thinner, you know, all yes. of those things. And then I've now, when I am like feeling, I can't get stuff done and I let myself rest. I get so much fun. And anytime I'm just kind to myself, my productivity is so much better than it was when I just push through, push through, push through. That is so, so true. Yeah. And I love that cycling back to working with our kids like that. If it works for us and it works for any, anything I've seen in, in working with our disease processes or sadness or anxiety, looking at it is as a loving, kind person and an empathetic person. Mm -hmm. let's, let's see how we can navigate this together and not make it wrong and not make the person wrong, but just this is a beautiful part of who you are. It's going to come with challenges, but what doesn't? So let's, let's find right. ways to make it a beautiful experience in your life. What are the gifts of it? What are the challenges? Yeah, the other thing to keep in mind that I, that was sort of a hard lesson for me to learn was it was very easy for me when my daughter was struggling at her worst to be the loving mom, to say, mm -hmm. sweetie, you've got to take care of yourself. You've got to do these things. However, if I was not modeling that same thing, I was, you know, it's not, they don't do what you say, they do what you do. Yes. So she was watching me. And if I was not practicing all the kinds of self-care that I was telling her to do, I'm telling her, you're feeling anxious, you need to meditate. Yes. Well, I needed to meditate. Yes. I needed to take the deep breaths. I need to do all the stuff. So she, and, and just show her, I really meant it. It really does matter. I'm doing it too, you know? Yeah. Well, and that brings up a really good point. I, um, when in working with my son with his high level of anxiety, I would get really frustrated, especially I'm um, most triggered around math homework. And during math homework, <laughs> he was triggering my old stuff 
when I was trying to learn math and I thought I was stupid. And so I would just, sometimes I would just blow up and say, I need to go on a walk. I need to take a deep breath, but then coming back and owning it, it's not you that made me frustrated or upset. That was my old wounding. This is my work. When, when we just own our stuff, especially with our kids, you know, we don't have to be the perfect parents. And I think the more we admit, you know, I made a mistake. I got too frustrated. Let's, let's take a breath. Let me get some air and then we can come back and revisit it. But again, it's not them. They don't have to walk on eggshells and you're not creating more, more anxiety. Right. Right. And that is, that is such, I mean, I think that's every parent's journey in a way we all get triggered by our own stuff. Um, and it comes out in fear, anger, you know, explosive outbursts, all kinds of things, little tantrums, again, adult versions of them, but it's all our own stuff. And yeah, until we can figure out how to manage our stuff, it's, it's hard to be the parent we want to be. Yes. I I wrote an article uh, about something like this not too long ago, just about how important it is for parents to get their own anxiety under control. If you want to even think about managing a child's anxiety And I got a response from an adult who had struggled with anxiety her whole life, who basically said, I did not get the help I needed because my parents couldn't handle it. I knew my parents weren't in a place where I could go to them and say how much I was struggling. And Mm -hmm. I thought that is like, if nothing else will motivate you as a parent, that was, it just broke my heart to think about this child hiding her struggles from her parents. Yeah, and so. and I think that's when we make our kids wrong or give them a disorder, it does create a gap. And when we don't admit, hey, I got triggered. This is my stuff. I was wrong. I'm really sorry. I think we create a gap. And I don't think we lose any, it's where I'm not being your friend and I'm not losing any of my role as a parent by saying, Hey, I was really wrong in this. I, I find that especially working with my son, then we come up with really positive solutions. Like we've got really good solutions for now working with math homework. If any one of us gets frustrated, you know, we just close it down and he FaceTimes his dad and they do it over FaceTime. That works perfectly. It's win, 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 yeah. you know, yeah. and that's, Absolutely. but had I not admitted it or I made him wrong about, you know, this is you, you, you're not listening or whatever it is, then we're just, cl- we're closed down that communication and there's nothing more to, to stay open to the possibilities of transcending this issue and maybe even making it better. And the, our anxious kids, uh, I'll say this for mine her anxiety often is presents. It doesn't present as like this fearful little mouse. It presents as when she was smaller, it was the meltdowns and the temper tantrums. And when as a teenager, it was more explosive outbursts of anger. Mm -hmm. And um, so she needs to see because she presents in that way. She has to learn those skills that she has to apologize so when she oh. sees me owning it and apologizing, it helps her see, oh, it happens to everyone. And when it does, this is what you do. You just own it and say you're sorry. Yeah. And, and life goes on. Everything's okay. Um, so it, I think it's really yeah. important for me to say, that was all me. I got upset. I got scared. I didn't know how to react. So I am sorry. I love that. And, and kind of circling back now to to ways that just maybe more tangible ways of reducing anxiety when it gets to that kind of that apex or the acute phase. I, you know, at least I saw with with myself and my son, who would get to a really acute phase and it was just almost hyperventilating with the anxiety and the fear of me leaving or something to that effect. Yeah. And each kid is different in what's going to be the most soothing. Because some kids I hear, um, they are so overstimulated that any, like even trying to hug them and touch them is even more 
stimulating. And yes. so they need separation. And this is where really figuring out and remembering what they were like as babies, what soothed mm -hmm. them as babies, were they self soothers that needed to just be by themselves? Or were they the ones that you had to rock and cuddle and hold to get them to yes. calm down? Um, and it's kind of those same things in those, mo those moments, either giving them the space when they say, uh, and it's clear they need that space to yeah. calm down, or to hug and hold until they can calm down and soothe a little bit. Um, and teaching them like the kinds of skills we I was talking about earlier when I said, you know, deep breathing, meditation, mm -hmm. um, and specific breath techniques. One thing I love, and I love it because it's, you know, I have a teenager and teenagers are glued to their phones. I'm a big fan of the Calm app. It's on oh, their phone. Okay. And it has like, there's one, it's a breath bubble, which it's just a, shows you to inhale and to exhale. And it just kind of shows a circle that goes in and goes out. I really slow. It's very calming just to look at it. And it tells you how long to inhale and exhale and it's on their phone. It's so simple. They can do it by themselves. Um, and there's a lot of other good things on the call. Yeah. Um, I like that. Okay, yeah. Especially I like um, anything that I can gamify with, with the relaxation techniques. My son is now finally hiking with me um, just because of the, the quarantine, but he's now gamifying the hikes where he'll, if we've gone at it again, he's, he times us so <laughs> kind of like so usually i'll say okay we're gonna have a timed portion of the route but that rest i want to just ground and and this is why i'm out here not to just <laughs> speed walk or speed hike through this but just like like you said like gamify it put the app on the phone exactly yeah and and each like i said each kid has their own kind of thing so your kind of competitive kid like that would love it, it, the kids that love sports and performance. And so those are great techniques for those kids. Um, if they're into music, you know, tie it to music, dance, yes. movement. Um, all of those are great. Just kind of getting something to get back in your body. I think when we're in that, that anxiety, you know, we've got that fear and the panic seems so real. And I think we're all here. Right. To be able to like the breaths or the dancing or grounding with nature or just listening to music really loud. Sometimes that has helped just something to get out of the swirls, the loops right. and back right. into the body. And then it's like, okay, Fred's here the, out of control. <laughs> right. Right. And yeah. so with the little kids, sometimes I'll, I'll have parents, Ask them, and you can do this with your older kids too, but little kids, this tends to work really well is ask a lot of questions and help them ask questions about what are you feeling in your body? Where is it? How big is it? And then you can even kind of, for the little ones, this can be kind of a silly, like if it was a color, what color was, is it? Um, if it made a sound, what kind of sound would it make? And but it, again, that's taking you out of your head and into your body, really feeling into what, mm -hmm. what's Fred feel like right now and yeah. where is Fred? how big is Fred? Um, and that helps you ground basically. Yeah. And without trying to change anything. Like you said, we're not trying to fight it. We're actually just accepting that it's there yes. and it's happening. I really, I, I want to just keep making that point too, because I've seen it time and time again, not with my, just with myself and my son and patients and clients, but it's when that the acceptance mm -hmm. and almost the, the submitting to what is and accepting it and, and saying, be as big as you need to be. What is yeah. your message? We don't like feeling bad. And we fear how big it could be and how long it could last. And you just yes. have to, it takes an element of trust that it's going to be okay and you can get through it. But there's a whole lot of research that says when you let it be as big as it needs to be and let it stay as long as it needs to stay, then it goes pretty quickly. You will it be does. And you can manage it, but it's yes. the fighting it that causes all of the problems. And how, so, and that's what I'm up against for the most part in my world is 
how to show someone that there is another possibility and the possibility is to accept it and let it be as big as it needs to be. I get so much resistance with that. Well, if you were coaching someone through it, either your child or a client, I would say um, to commit to being there through it with them at least once. Mm -hmm. Let's do it together. And I, I know exactly what you're saying because I work with adults and and I, I actually have one of my all-time favorite clients who's been my client forever who is a police officer. I mean, so you, it, tough, tough goes out there, yeah. would, is willing to take a bullet. But when it comes to feeling bad feelings, <laughs> it just shows you how your toughest, bravest people in the world don't like doing it. And so we, yeah. you know, have practiced it together. So if anything goes wrong, I'm here. Right. I'll be here with you. Yes. Don't end. And, and two, I mean, especially for the police officer, you can say that is the warrior's <laughs> path. You know, that is strange yes. to sit with that anxiety because look how hard it is. It's easy to go and distract yourself and, you know, right. do a million and one different things. But to sit there and feel your feelings, that takes a warrior. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And in some ways, that's what I say about our anxious kids is, you know, they are they are amazing because they do feel so much and they still get out of bed every day and still go back out yes. in there. They're feeling a lot of stuff. So kudos yeah. to them. Kudos to them and navigating the school system now and navigating this whole, you know, upheaval with this entire world and differences <laughs> and, and how they're going to socialize now and, but they're just rolling with it. They're so adaptable. You know, I think what you had said in the beginning, it's the parents now, the adults that are having the anxiety, the kids, you know, the, all this pressure has been taken off of them. And I think a lot of the pressure that's been taken off of them should stay off. That's just my little two cents, yeah. you know, great to have them in, in, a, in a little bit of activities, but it's not, it can be so overwhelming and all this togetherness right now and being able to hike and connect and be do puzzles together like that's that's why yeah. we're here we're not here just to get to the finish line and be done with 70 million activities uh, yes absolutely i mean even the little things seem to be making a difference my school my kids schools are um they are doing online schools they move to the online classrooms but they are starting at nine and yes. so you know, 730 and yeah, you, their moods are a thousand times better <laughs> just starting a little later and the I schools know. have resisted that so much over the years. Even and this, all the, the evidence, been, yes, yeah. <laughs> research has been there forever and it's just the wheels of the government move so slowly, but there's always ways around yeah. it. And I think, you know, there's always, I always look for the loophole and I think as parents, there's always something we can do doctor's note saying they shouldn't start before 11 or something you know whatever it is <laughs> there's there's ways around right. it and especially right now we have a lot more freedom you know because parents are still having to work and having to figure out when they can be home to help their kids as now the, the online the, the online schools and now they're in the role of the the parent teacher so we're all navigating that yeah difficulties. So um, kind of in wrapping up, what would you, what are some, some of the biggest things that you've learned, especially from your experience in raising um, a, the, your, a child that, that has this anxiety? What, would, what could you tell parents that are just starting the, the road If you're just starting out and you're starting to be concerned or see some signs that maybe your child has the high highs and low lows or is super reactive to their environment or has big fears, um, the best things you can do when they're young is, as we've said over and over and over again, help them to befriend that, to accept that this is how they work, um, make get as normal as you possibly can for them. Keep, you know, saying over and over, this is normal. Everybody feels this way. 
This is how you work. And you just have to learn how to manage the way you work. Like every person on the planet has to manage how they work. Give them language. That's another thing that's tricky mm-hmm. for kids because they don't know what's going on and they don't know how to describe it. And sometimes it does seem weird because they're at school and they're feeling these things and their friends aren't acting this way, but they are. And so you, by saying it's normal and this is how you work and let's, you know, this is Fred is showing up, you know, give them that, that type of language to help them communicate and talk about it. It uh, is such a gift. The earlier you can do that, the better, I would say. Um, And if you are like me, who probably I didn't do those things, these are all things in hindsight, I wish I would have done better. But if you're at a later stage, you're in middle school, and suddenly things start to flare up, that's what happened to me. And you could see in hindsight, oh, this was a sign and this was a sign, but I didn't pick up on those signs. Um, A, there's no value in beating yourself up. Um, If it makes you feel better, I have all the education. I have a PhD in psychology and I didn't see it. So it happens. Some, we don't always see, except in hindsight, the signs. Yeah. And thank you for saying that too, because I think, it's so it's so easy to judge other parents and it's so easy to judge ourselves. Like I should have seen that I've got all the training and, yeah. and this, and we don't, we don't, we're just, you know, it's your, you've got your forest and your trees that you're living together. This is your baby. You've seen them, you know, every moment until they, they get to this stage. So that I love that. Just forgive yourself. And then from this moment, what do I take? you know, and yes. don't make it wrong. And I love the language around it. You know, <laughs> thinking now, when you just said that, I was like, Oh, I should have done that when my son was in his really anxious phase. But I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> no, I should have too. I, but I didn't. But we got we got through it. And we got through it just fine. And I think that that's the other thing. It's, it's, we, we absolutely have done the best we could in the moment. Yes. And, and they have two. Yes. And then in this moment, now that I know more and we can, we can do a different trajectory, we can change our course. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And remember how resilient and amazing our kids are that even though we didn't know what we didn't know and could have done things better, look how awesome they've, they're turning out. So Yes, that's very true. <laughs> I, and I, I like that. And they get to, to choose their course. I don't need to, I think that's the biggest thing I've learned with my son is I let him pick his activities. I have my ideas. They are not his ideas. <laughs> and he has never <laughs> once picked my ideas. But when and and it's it was a learning curve too because i was sitting there you know week after week like pick something come on yeah. and and it i but i didn't push him and he find when he did pick uh, drums he just took to it and he's self motivated and i don't have to ask him to practice and he is learning songs on his own so that's the beauty in it and it's his right choice. And so yeah. now he's learning independence. He's learning he gets to choose who he is, not the other way around. I'm going to tell you who you are and you're going to do it my way or the highway that again crew would create more anxiety. Yeah. And that's so hard as parents. I will say from my own journey like one of my children was a good swimmer at an early age, a good swimmer. And so there were coaches and people at, when she was very small saying, she needs to swim. You have to get her in you year round swimming. And she hated, hated <laughs> swimming. Yes. And it was so hard as a parent to be like, but, but you're good at this. You yeah. should do it. And it, it, it wasn't her thing. She yes. hated it. So yeah. You have yeah, to let, let them remember make remember back too. You know, the thing, I hated piano. My mom forced me to play piano. Ten years. I will never touch a piano. I don't like, I can't even listen to a song with right. a piano in it. It's, it doesn't, it didn't 
do anything for me except for make me resent the whole experience. And now I can't listen to songs with piano <laughs> without getting anxious. So I see your book in the background. Can you, is, can you grab that and just show everybody? And I'll have all the links. Oh, that's a nice cover. I like that with the balloons. Yeah, and that's sweet. They did a good job. Yeah, I really like that. Um, and I'll have all the links to your bio and where they can find the book. Um, and so in, in closing, who would you say is your biggest teacher? Um, absolutely, without doubt, my two children have been my biggest teachers um, and still are. And I mean, in different ways. It's amazing. That's what the gift of having two who are, have been in complete opposites is they constantly are challenging me in different ways and challenging me to step up. <laughs> yes. Oh, they do. Yeah. I think when you're committed to, to being the best that you can be and keeping communication open every I wouldn't even say every day is different. I would say every moment's different. I'm, I'm having to parent in different ways every time and the bar is constantly changing. It's not like it's raising at a steady rate. It's like it's up here and it's down here and it's over here. It's just, yeah. you're, just, you're just working with it and doing the absolute best. But I, I do like that challenge. Yes, I do too. I do too. I, um, I had, so my kids are 16 months apart and I had 16 months when my son was a baby and was the easy, easy, easy baby that I thought I was a good mother. And that was the only, those are my 16 months I got. And after that, it was all gone. <laughs> that's, that's a perfect way. I love that. Well, that's got to be a quote because that's how it is. It is. It's like, and then, you know, and it's easy to look at other mothers that have those screaming colicky babies. It's like, well, I must That's be doing something right. No, they just came out like that. But thank you for, yeah, and thank you for doing the work that you do and for writing that book. And um, I really enjoyed reading it personally. And oh. it's given me a lot of takeaways to, to navigate this now 13 and on with my son. Well, great. Great. I'm glad it did. And thank you so much for having me. This was an awesome conversation. Good.